My name is Khaled Keith Perry and I am a member of Rochester Monthly Meeting, of Farmington Scipio Regional Meeting, of New York Yearly Meeting, and I live in Rochester, New York. Uh, I uh, once had a video up on YouTube about uh, liberal Quakerism, but that account was uh, mysteriously deleted by uh, Google, so I'm making another video with much of the same content, uh, perhaps a little bit more organizedly. Uh, so the preface to all of the stuff I'm about to say is uh, I speak from my own experience and I'm trying to articulate it as truthfully as I do know, but I'm not speaking for anyone else. Uh, this is simply my perspective on some of these things. So the question at hand is what is liberal Quakerism? And there's really three responses to that question that I think are necessary to at least get even the barest sketch of what the truth is. So the first thing is, what is the answer to that question historically? Second thing is, what is the answer to that contemporarily? And third thing is, what is the answer to that personally? For me, what is the Religious Society of Friends? And um, so the way to do this, and most of the information has been the bulk around historically, so we'll just start right there. The liberal section of the Religious Society of Friends stems, unsurprisingly, from the Religious Society of Friends at its beginning. So it's worth talking a little bit about the origins of the Religious Society of Friends writ large before any of the splits or schisms or different types of Quakers emerged. So in the 1650s, kind of 1655 and onward, the Religious Society of Friends was expanding. And uh, rather than go into the actual history of all that, I'll just say there are things that I think are distinctives for the Religious Society of Friends fivefold. Uh, the first is something uh, we call the unmediated access to the divine. So that's the belief that without the need for a priest or someone who's ordained, that everyone can be in contact with, uh, with God, with the Spirit of God, that we don't need someone else to intervene on our behalf. There's, there's not a difference between some people who are special and holy who can connect with God better than other people. Everyone has equal access to God if they take the time um, and the inner and outer discipline of, of connecting through a prayer life or a life of discipline and practice. So an unmediated uh, connection with the divine. Second major thing, um, in terms of a distinctive, would be our silent worship, which is uh, without a pastor, without a priest, uh, the question was, well, what does liturgy look like? How do we worship together? And the response was in silent prayer. So the body would gather together, everyone who was part of the congregation, and they would silently pray and hope that one of them would receive a message. So whereas previously a priest or a pastor might uh, figure out what the sermon would be, what the topic would be for that day, and would write it out or plan it out, and then would preach from a text on a given day, uh, friends early on discovered that what they could do is meet together silently in prayer and wait and in waiting prayer, see if there was something they were supposed to say that day. And if this thing emerged as a, as a voice and, a, and a, something to say that they needed to say, they would rise and speak in ministry to whoever was there. And anyone could do that, uh, men or women, and uh, they would then become the person through whom the message for that day would be given. Very different in terms of liturgy and the format of worship. So first thing, unmediated access to the divine. As a result of that, this silent meeting for worship called a waiting meeting for worship, where people would gather silently and wait for the message to be given. Third, coming out of that meeting for worship was this idea of corporate discernment, which is to say, just as in the meeting for worship, whatever the message for that day was trusted to emerge from the body through the Holy Spirit, well, that's how the business would be done, too. So if we needed to make a decision about whether a certain family was going to move, and they were saying, you know, I need some help figuring out whether I'm supposed to move, or contemporarily, um, are we supposed to install a, a new rug in our meeting house? Um, are we supposed to support the ministry of this person who wants to go to Africa or to Haiti, or, or maybe they want to do something in the city? Well, all those questions, which are questions of discernment, the belief was that corporately, as a worshiping body, the congregation could come together and through discernment and prayer actually discern the will of God. And it wasn't up to certain individualized people, priests or popes or pastors, but that corporately as a community and necessarily more than one, we could work together and work towards some sense of what is true and right for us to be doing. Which leads us to another distinctive, continuing revelation. So very early on, there was this understanding that what we understand to be true now may in fact be shifting. So we don't know for sure that we know the whole story, uh, kit and caboodle, and we're done, and we got it, and we claim it. 
No, instead the idea is that as we continue to pray and live and be in community with one another, as we continue to do discernment around the various pieces of each other's lives and as our corporate life together, new truth will be revealed. So revelation is not fixed and finished and done and packed away somewhere and shrink wrapped. It continues to emerge as we continue to respond faithfully to the promptings that were given. So continuing revelation is a mark of friends. Um, Another piece is uh, this notion that there is that of God in every man and woman. And this has led to some things that our friends are familiar with and people are familiar with friends with because of. Um, primarily something like called the peace testimony, which is a longer issue, uh, but the basis of it would be to say, look, if there is that of God in, in everyone, who am I to destroy this person? If this is my brother or my sister or my husband or, or someone else's brother or sister or, or son or husband or daughter, who am I to kill them? Isn't that an offense to, to God directly? Um, and so it, it couldn't be conceived of a way in which that this, the death of this person by my hand would be righteous or justice. There's, there's no conception of that. Because the belief is there is that of God, some essence or mark of Christ in, in all people. Um, and then the last piece of that, um, which ex- extends from it, is if there is that of God in each of us, then we can each live into a holy life, a life that God would have wanted for us, then the mark of our faithfulness is not what we say or what we believe, but how we live our lives out. Early friends did not have creeds. They didn't have pastors or priests or formal liturgy, and they didn't have statements of belief or faith because they believed that their life should speak. As an old Quaker uh, maxim says, let your life speak, that your life is what you, there's what, a testimony or testament to your faithfulness, not whether you say you believe something or not. So we are one of the non-creedal traditions. We don't have a, a statement of faith. We don't say the Nicene Creed or the Nicene Constantinopolitan or the Apostles' Creed. None of those creeds are things we say. And hopefully, it's the life we live that is, in fact, a testament to what we believe. So, unmediated access to the divine, uh, silent worship, corporate discernment, the belief in continuing revelation, and that of God in every person leading into this creedless, experiential faith. That's the historical basis of this liberal society of friends in the origins of the religious society of friends in general. So contemporarily, if you went to a a meeting, if you went online, for example, to quakerfinder.org, you could find yourself a liberal Quaker meeting somewhere, and you could go there. Or perhaps you know that there's one in your city. Uh, They're smattered around. They often are associated with college towns or college cities. Um, And if you ended up there, uh, what would you see? Well, um, sociologically speaking, it would tend to be mostly white. It probably would be um, middle class to upper middle class, uh, tend to be, in terms of politics, pretty progressive, liberal, um, and uh, education tends to be pretty high. Most folk, I would say, probably have graduated high school and college, a lot of advanced degrees. Now, of course, none of these things make you a Quaker or are necessary to be a Quaker. However, uh, descriptively, these tend to these things tend to be true of folks that do uh, find themselves to be friends. Uh, different than a lot of other denominations, there's an enormous percentage of um, people who are converts, or what in the language of friends is called convinced friends. That's to say, in Rochester meeting, um, there's about uh, 90 or so people who are members on, you know, on the books, and of those 90, uh, no more than 10 were folks who were actually raised in the tradition. So an enormous amount of folks who are converting or kind of convinced in coming into uh, the tradition as opposed to having been raised in it. Uh, theologically, the folks there, partly because of people's own back history and not having been raised in the tradition, come from a lot of different angles. Uh, if you combine uh, a lot of new folks in a new tradition uh, to them, along with the historical um, arc of non-creedal statements and um, a desire to not uh, be firm and rigid in statements of belief, um, well, then you end up getting a, a big mix. Uh, what it feels like to a lot of folk uh, is actually quite similar theologically to the Unitarian Universalists. Uh, there are folks in contemporary liberal Quaker meetings that uh, identify themselves as uh, Buddhist Quakers or as Jewish Quakers or as uh, Universalist Quakers. There, are, in fact, is a, a rise of folks who um, claim to be agnostic or uh, or um, 
atheistic Quaker. So it's kind of a, a, a motley crew that often joins itself in the liberal um, Quakerism. So, so why are these people coming? So, so what is it that draws them to the Quaker meeting then? Well, oftentimes it's because of something that uh, is called the Quaker Testimonies. And uh, sometimes, maybe frequently, the Quaker Testimonies are taught through the acronym SPICES. Spirituality, Peace, Integrity, Community, Equality, and Stewardship of the Earth. Uh, and those are things that um, Quakers are often uh, associated with. Uh, interestingly, though, the testimonies, which are often taught now as kind of uh, Quaker values, uh, the origin is, again, from that meeting for worship, that expectant, silent meeting for worship. And the idea is that the testimonies we have now, which are kind of more codified than they used to be, uh, were actually testimony. It was a testifying to an experience, just like it would have been in a courtroom. And if someone said, Do, are you swearing this? Is this your testimony? He said, yes. And the experience that they were testifying to uh, was an inward experience with the Holy Spirit. And so in prayer life, and then communally, in communal prayer life and discernment, this, the, it went that, hey, I've had this experience, and it, it's been opened up in my heart that I can no longer participate in war, or I can no longer hold slaves, or it's not right to cheat people at the market, whatever it is, um, was actually a reference to an inward experience. Um, and so it was a testimony like that. It was grounded in the Holy Spirit in an experience and engagement with Christ. Well, down the road, uh, down the path in which liberal Quakers has taken, not necessarily as tied for everyone to Christian scriptures or to Christian tradition, uh, it has resulted in this more codified form of things that is kind of social justice oriented. And a lot of folks come to the congregation um, because of this outward work. So I'm there not so much for the social justice purposes, but because of what um, I perceive um, as the ideal of the Religious Society of Friends, which is spiritual formation um, and development th through discipline and relationships, not through dogma and doctrine. Which is to say, it's a place where you can really work on your inward self and trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing with your life, and then have a place to practice and be supported and nurtured uh, to live your outward life, your life in the world in a way that matches the things you're realizing and learning about yourself spiritually. And it happens not as a result of a checklist or things that are being told or taught from the outside through, through rules, but as a result of a relationship of people that are in faith with one another and saying, you know what, we don't know the way forward, we don't even know what the rules are for the way forward, but but in prayer and in discernment, we can figure the way out um, together um, with one another. We're all members of this body of Christ. I am uh, unabashedly a Christian, and I am a liberal Quaker. So it's certainly not the case that you can't be a Christian and be in liberal Quaker tradition. In fact, it makes the most sense for me that that's the way it is. However, I know that when I first came to the tradition, uh, the texts and the books that were more important to me were the Hindu and yoga traditions and the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana. So it's not as if... Um, uh, I was excluded back in the day. In fact, one of the reasons that the liberal Quaker tradition was appealing to me at first is that no one told me I had to have a Bible in my hand. Well, as time has gone on and I've deepened in my faith, I've really felt it necessary to get back in touch with the roots and the origins of our tradition, and those are also unabashedly Christian. And so when you read the journals of the first couple generations of friends, they're littered with scripture, and it's all over the place, and it's part of what I understand to be the ethos in the origins of our traditions. So, at the best of the best possible days, the thing and the place that I understand liberal Quakerism to be at is an acknowledgement that we can all talk about some kind of divine other, some holy presence, and God. And for me, that's identified in the Holy Spirit and in Christ, and the story of that resurrection is incredibly important to me. Uh, and perhaps I'm also worshiping next to someone for whom that language is uncomfortable, and so they find another way of articulating that that works in their own world. The best and the kind of ideal functioning of the liberal religious society of friends is that those practices are live and that there's power in them, not because it's social justice only and people like the ideas politically around it, but because something is going on in their hearts and in their inward life and they want to share that with others and do that in a loving, engaged way so that it then impacts the world um, beyond their meaning. Does it always work out that way? Uh, of course not. Um, but on its best days, uh, that's what it tries to be.